Hello, everyone. My name is Lynn Cooley, and I have the honor of being the Dean of Yale Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to our annual, actually our seventh annual, three-minute thesis competition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have to start by thanking Hunja Shin and Jacob Gonzalez from the Office of Career Strategy and all the people who've helped them for organizing this event. Each year, I look forward to the three-minute thesis. Actually, we call it the 3MT for short. I look forward to the 3MT in particular because I really, because I think it really does encapsulate the essence of what we do in graduate school. Being able to relay a complex message in a concise way that demonstrates two ex true expertise over a subject and that level of expertise is the goal of graduate education. Honing your communication and, and disseminating your research are also key skills that will bring, bring all our students success in whatever career they pursue after graduation, whether you stay within the academy or in anywhere else. Today's finalists have already competed in their, in their division and represent the top contenders in the graduate school. I offer my congratulations to all of them for the hard work that got them here. I'm also, I'm also eager to see what they have in store for us, and so we will jump right in and explain how this will work. So I'm happy to say we have four distinguished alums of the graduate school here today to judge today's competition. We will take into consideration comprehension, content, visuals, delivery, and communication in the presentations. I'll be part of the judging along with my, um, my famous alumni from the graduate school, and they are Kim Boehm, who, who uh, 1992 PhD in American Studies, Catherine Cohen, PhD 1997 Spanish and Portuguese, Bert Eshagapur, 1979, PhD in chemistry, and David Sanchez, 1984, MPhil, political science. So, I want to tell you just a little bit about them. So, uh, uh, Kim Bohm is a writer who most recently had a long career as a university academic and administrator. Her academic career began at the College of William and Mary, as where, as, as where she held the Francis L. and Edwin L. Cummings Chair of History and American Studies. Her research focused on the history of African American culture and United States workers. She then moved into college administration, first as the founding dean of the School of Humanities and Social Studies, Social Sciences at Brooklyn College in the CUNY system, and then as provost and dean of the faculty at Mills College. She's authored numerous articles and award-winning books, and she now serves on university and community boards in San Francisco. And I've learned she just finished her first novel, which I am looking forward to reading. Kat Cohen is one of the leading independent university admissions counselors in the world. She is the founder and CEO of IvyWise, a comprehensive educational consulting company that works with students globally over 59 countries to help them get into the schools of their choice. Kat is also the best-selling author of The Truth About Getting In and Rock Hard Apps, and is a sought-after speaker and expert on university admissions. She serves as the higher education expert for LinkedIn and on the Ed Educational Advisory Board of React to Film. She also regularly contributes to a new, numerous media outlets, including the Today Show, CNN, CNBC, Fox Business, Forbes, and the New York Times. Bert Eshagpur, whose name I'm just learning how to pronounce, is the president of Wego Chemical and Mineral Corporation, a startup trading company focused on the import and distribution of chemicals that he began working at after completing his PhD here at Yale. 
He began as a salesman in 1979 and now, with his family, owns the company, which has become a 45-year-old global company with offices and staff around the world. Wego employs over 170 people engaged in the business of sales and transportation of specialized chemicals from China and elsewhere around the globe. He is incredibly proud of the fact that all three of his children are now actively working at the company, and he's slowly transitioning his management responsibilities to them. David Sanchez is the founder and CEO of Singular Global, a Florida-based consulting firm specializing in alternative investment vehicles since 2005, and of Sanchez Global LLC in Puerto Rico as of 2021. He's also a managing director with Zambodo Securities, uh, a Mountain View, California broker-dealer. At Zambado Exchange, the Zambado Exchange specializes in brokering secondary securities with over $40 billion in listed shares for trading. David formerly served as president of Sanchez Global Advisors, LLC, a registered as a registered investment advisor. He's a, he served as the managing director at Bear Stearns. He was the vice president at Merrill Lynch International, head of mergers and acquisitions department for Latin America as vice president of Bank, Bank, Bankers Trust Company, and assistant treasurer in the M&A financial advisory department of JP Morgan. So I hope what you just heard me say is the amazing things you can do with a Yale PhD. Thank you all for being here. So now I'm going to turn things over to our host for the competition, Saray Reed. Saray Reed is a fifth year PhD student in the Mechanical Engineering and Materials Science Department and an Office of Career Strategy Fellow. Thank you, Saray. Thank you, Dean Cooley, for your introductory remarks. Before we get underway, I would like to summarize the event schedule for this evening. The competition is projected to last one hour and 45 minutes. For our in-person audience, please remember to silence your cell phones now. After my remarks, Julia Istamina will share information about the Poor View Center Certificate for Public Communication. Then we'll hear from our 10 presenters. After the presentations are over, we will then have the opportunity to learn more about our illustri illustrious panel of judges via a Q&A session. After that, I will invite everyone in the audience to vote for their favorite presentations for the People's Choice Awards. While we vote, the judges will leave the room to choose the first, second, and third place winners, and we will enjoy a performance by the Citations, a graduate student a cappella group. To conclude our event, Dean Cooley will be back here to announce this year's winners. Light snacks will be available at the end of the event. Please note that this is a hybrid event. It is being recorded and will be made available later on. We please ask that you do not share the voting information with any individuals who are not present today. With that being said, many of our contestants took advantage of the Graduate Writing Lab resources to polish their presentations. I would like to invite Julia Istamina, the Associate Director of the Graduate Writing Lab, to speak about one of these resources, the Porvoo Center Public Communication Certificate Program. Thank you so much, Sarai. I'm so excited to be here and to tell you a little bit about the program and to recognize our certificate uh, earners this year. To be honest, when we formalized this program, I was really excited to work with our students, and I never thought I would have to give a speech myself. Uh, but here we are, and it's going to be fine. Um, the certificate program really evolved organically from the collaborations and resources we already had in place across the McDougal uh, Center offices and the Porvoo Center. Uh, four years ago, we kind of thought about it and we realized, wow, it's a lot of work to do all this in a mere few months. You know, thinking about just putting together a script, uh, thinking about crafting it into a, a compelling story arc, uh, thinking about visuals that are compelling, right, and will draw an audience in, um, and even just stage presence. All of that in a mere few months and then competing in the um, divisional round. So it's a lot of work that everyone has to do, uh, whether or not they you know, make it to the finals. And we kind of just, um, 
used the existing resources and built out a program that has three frameworks. So the first framework is designing your content, the next one is receiving feedback, and of course the, th uh, the final one is polishing your presentation. And so with the certificate program, those who enroll in it, we kind of, they pace their way through the 3MT, but they also uh, fulfill some requirements by uh, taking part in a number of different uh, program resources. So first we have general workshops that they attend and learn more about various aspects of public communication, uh, public speaking, uh, you know, crafting a research narrative, meeting individual with uh, individual consultations with directors uh, from across the McDougal offices, myself, uh, graduate writing lab, writing fellows, and other administrators to get feedback one on one, and also participating in interdisciplinary uh, public uh, speaking clinics where it's really cool because they're kind of small cohorts, but you the students get to learn about each other's research across the divisions and the disciplines. So it's a really great opportunity to kind of network and see what everyone kind of does in their uh, kind of departments and programs. They also practice with a Pitch Vantage public speaking studio and uh, kind of work with navigating you know, feedback and applying uh, the suggestions to make their presentation even better. And last but not least, they compete in the three minute thesis uh, divisional uh, rounds. So that's kind of the scope of the program. And uh, last year we designed a certificate which we think looks pretty snazzy. And what's cool about it is that this is in PDF format, so students can add it to their CV, they can add it to their portfolio, they can attach it to a LinkedIn profile, they can kind of just leverage it any way that they need to, whether they're looking into not, you know, all positions, industry positions, or academic positions, where of course, public speaking, good communication is very important. So uh, without further ado, I would love to recognize this year's certificate earners. I'm excited to say that we doubled the number of certificate earners who successfully um, made it through the program uh, from 10 to 20, and that's the highest number we've ever seen, which just goes to show that these skills are, you know, continue to be uh, held in high regard. So uh, I will ask you to hold your applause until the end, just for the sake of time, so we can get to the good stuff. Uh, but I'll uh, say the name and the department of, of the people that we honor today. So congratulations, Elizabeth Wu, Neuroscience. Andrew Verdesca, Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. Sophie Richardson, English. Ming Grijou, Electrical Engineering. Taya Tarosi, Chemistry. Arti Venkat, Computational Biology and Bioinformatics. Amy Zhao, Genetics. Sateja Paratkar, Pathology. Mamie Wang, Computational Biology and Bioinformatics. Cheng Hang She, Astronomy. Atreo Paul, Genetics. Morgan Galloway, Political Science. Niam Kwan Hyung, Economics. Nata Dudkina, Chemistry. Matea Morales, Genetics. Zili Shen, Astronomy. Adil Akif, Biomedical Engineering. Jesse Wang, Genetics. And last but not least, Xiaoting Shi, Environmental Health Sciences. Aladdin Ibrahimi, Biomedical Engineering. So let's give a round of applause for everyone who worked really hard. Thank you. Yes. And for those of you in the audience who are new to this process and are eligible, maybe we'll see you next year to uh, design your own content. So thank you so much for your time. And now onto the presentations. This year, for the first time, we held competitions within each of the five divisions of the graduate school. Today's 10 finalists, as mentioned before, are the top winners from these divisional rounds and represent the fascinating and diverse research graduate students at Yale are conducting. We are very excited to share their work with you today. We ask that you hold your applause until the end of each presentation, and after each presentation, the judges will have 90 seconds to record their scores. For our first presenter, we have Sophie Richardson, a seventh year student in the English department. Sophie's three minute thesis is titled, Surface as Simile, Material Metaphors in Early Modern English Literature. Sophie. If I were to ask someone, what is a book made out of? They might say, paper, ink, glue. They would be right. Or they might say, chapters, stories, ideas. They would also be right. Because when we talk about a book, sometimes we mean a physical container, paper, ink, glue. And sometimes we mean a conceptual container, chapters, stories, ideas. But most of the time, we're talking about both at once, even if we don't always realize it. 
In my work, I argue that the physical and conceptual structures of knowledge don't just coincide, they actively co-create one another. In my dissertation, I look at a series of case studies from 16th and 17th century England where we see extreme examples of this at play. To offer you just one example, in 1598, Christopher Marlowe publishes the first English translation of a classical Greek poem telling the story of Hero and Leander. In Marlowe's version, when Leander first sees Hero, she's standing in the temple of Venus on a floor made of glass. Looking through the floor, she sees an array of statues from classical Greek mythology. Looking at the floor, she sees a reflection of herself. All around her is Venus's majestic temple showing scenes from the goddess's life. And embroidered very tiny on her sleeve is Venus once again falling in love with Adonis. So the floor is doing three things at once here. It's a window onto the classical past. It's a mirror, the translator's copy of the story. And it's a lens, miniaturizing some, version, uh, some elements and maximizing others. And through the floor's three attributes, its transparency, reflectivity, and refractivity, we can also see Marlowe's stance on his own role as poet translator. He acknowledges his source text. He creates his own copy of the story. He miniaturizes the contributions of other authors while magnifying his own. So Venus and Adonis, also the title of a contemporary poem by William Shakespeare, is shrunken down into a tiny marginal reference, while the temple, described in only a single word in the Greek original, lordly, is magnified into an elaborate 22-line set piece in English. Marlowe's showing off, of course, but his metaphor is not mere flourish. Metaphor is methodology. In 16th century England, glass and garments and feathers and leathers and lace, these are the tools authors use to describe new forms to theorize shifting genres, and to articulate cultural concerns about originality, artistry, and the place of English literature on an increasingly global stage. Thank you. Our next presenter is Elizabeth Wu, a fourth year student in the Interdepartmental Neuroscience Program. Elizabeth's three minute thesis is titled, The Brain's Calcium Problem in a Glowing Solution. Oscar Wilde once wrote, memory is the diary that we all carry about with us. But many of us won't get to keep our diaries forever. By 2050, 12.5 million Americans will have Alzheimer's disease, and we still don't have any preventative therapies. Our brains are composed of vast networks of neurons, allowing complex functions like memory to emerge. Neurons form these networks by communicating with each other at the synapse, magnified here, connecting neurons A and B. These connection sites are so important that many studies have shown that synapse loss best correlates with memory loss, behooving us to look to the synapse for clues. So when we examine vulnerable synapses of Alzheimer's patients, we observe increased calcium in one part of the synapse. Calcium is essential for neuronal function and communication, thus it is tightly controlled. When it isn't, we see signs of stress in the neurons but we still don't know exactly how increased calcium alters the synapse. That's where I come in. My work focuses on a specific receptor that controls calcium release from calcium stores. Imagine the receptor as a faucet. In the healthy synapse, the faucet can turn on and off. In Alzheimer's disease, this faucet is constantly on, leading to increased levels of calcium. But what does this mean for the synapse? To answer this, I decided to examine the proteins that make up the synapse, as proteins are the building blocks for synaptic function and health. To do this, I use a genetically modified mouse with a mutation in this receptor, which mimics the leaky calcium faucet. From healthy and mutated mice, I isolate the synapses from their brains, and I feed them through a machine called a mass spectrometer, allowing me to compare what proteins and how many of them make up these synapses. This is exciting because for the first time, we can now identify which proteins are increased or decreased due to excess calcium. One especially exciting finding is that there are higher amounts of the protein GLOW1 in pink in the unhealthy synapse. 
from prior work, we already know GLOW-1 helps to eliminate toxic, damaging molecules from neurons. So I hypothesize that GLOW-1 is the neuron's defense system against the damage caused by excess calcium. Now, like me, you may be wondering, could GLOW-1 be a therapeutic tool to help protect synapses earlier on and prevent disease? That's what my research seeks to test next and illuminate. While this leaky calcium faucet is relevant to Alzheimer's disease, we observe this phenomenon in aging and even long COVID, so we must demystify the how. Only then can we dream of a world where we all get to keep our diaries. Thank you. Our next presenter is Aladdin Ebrahimi, a second year student in the biomedical engineering department. Aladdin's three minute thesis title is Drug Affinity in the Brain a new approach in early phase drug development. One billion dollars and 10 years. That's on average how much time and money it takes to develop a single drug. Drug development is a long and expensive process due to the number of clinical trials needed to ensure drug safety and efficacy. My research goal is to optimize dosing of the candidate drugs in preclinical trials using positron emission tomography or PET imaging. This could reduce the number of clinical trials needed, saving time and cost. Drug affinity is calculated based on an estimate of affinity. This affinity is how strongly a drug binds to the target receptor. Typically, pharmaceutical companies assume that a drug has the same affinity everywhere in the brain and estimate a single drug concentration for the whole brain. We challenge this idea. Imagine you're overseeing COVID-19 vaccine distribution in this state. Looking at the population density map shown in A, would you deliver the same number of vaccines to every state? Of course not. Just as how COVID vaccine distribution is based on population density, the drug affinity in different regions of the brain is also based on factors such as distribution and the number of the target receptor. As shown in B, we studied the drug CVL-865 that it has the potential to treat epilepsy with fewer side effects. This drug has different affinity to different GABA-A receptor subtypes in the human brain, which we were able to detect using our method. To validate uh, the accuracy of our methodology, we conducted a simulation study shown in C. As part of this study, we generated fake data that will result in an affinity map with regional variations in the brain. This affinity map shown in C1 acted as the ground truth for the comparison purposes. Our method shown in C3 accurately detected these regional variations in affinity compared to the conventional way of estimating a single drug concentration for the whole brain, shown in C2. This confirms the accuracy of our methodology and findings. We believe our methodology and findings have the potential to enhance drug development in early phase drug trials. This could lead to a better dose selection, and this could potentially lead to a fewer number of clinical trials needed, which would save millions of dollars, and years of time. Thank you. Up next, we have Catherine Graves, a fifth year student in the psychology department. Catherine's three minute thesis title is Minds in Motion, How the Human Brain Gives Rise to Real World Navigation. Everyone here is unique. But I would hazard to guess there's at least one thing that we all have in common, which is that all of us navigated here. Presumably no one is naturally occurring in this room. No, instead we all made it from point A to point B. And this might not sound like a big deal, but our ability to navigate envi our, our environments is vital to our survival and is actually quite complex. Because with every step you're taking, you're representing where you are in space, where you came from, and where you're going. And this is supported by a region in the brain called the hippocampus, and in certain neurodegenerative diseases, diseases where cells in the brain actually die, this region can become damaged, and this ability can become impaired. 
So it's important for neuroscientists to understand how navigation is instantiated in the brain so that we can better understand and make predictions about how and when things will go wrong. Now, previous attempts at decoding the navigating brain were done not in humans, but in animals, with electrodes implanted in their hippocampus as they navigated different enclosures. And this work gave us an incredible window into how the hippocampus supports navigation. Namely, it acts as a map, representing the animal's location and physical space, a speedometer, keeping track of its speed, and a compass, encoding what direction the animal was moving in. But importantly, it wasn't quite clear how this translated to human navigation, namely because putting invasive recording technology in people's brains just because is generally frowned upon as a research methodology. However, there's a new treatment for patients with medication-resistant epilepsy that involves putting a small device below the skull with electrodes in regions of the brain like the hippocampus. This device is always recording neural data, looking for a pattern that it recognizes as a seizure, and then stimulating the brain to end that seizure. That's the clinical purpose. But what that means for us is that we can ask patients to wear our specialized setup, here modeled by myself and my colleague and friend, Dr. Ben Sherman, that allows us to get that data wirelessly while patients walk around in real world space. Devices like these are the only method that exists in the world today that allow us to get this kind of data. So in our experiment, what we wanted to know is, do the signals that arise in animals also emerge in humans? We had patients wear our fancy setup and walk around in a big multimedia studio while we recorded data from their brains. We then submitted that data to machine learning methods and found that just from the activity in the hippocampus, we could reliably predict where the patients were in space, how fast they were walking, and in what direction. Map, speedometer, compass. This work not only bridges the decades of animal work with what little is known about human navigation, but provides a promising dimension on which we could start to study neurodegeneration. And more generally, it gives us a hint as to how it is that we as humans make it from point A to point B. Thank you. Our next presenter is Zili Shen, a fourth year student in astronomy. Zili's three minute thesis title is finding the biggest dwarf galaxies in our cosmic neighborhood. Zili. Have you ever seen the Milky Way, our home galaxy, stretch across the night sky? Have you ever wondered what's beyond our galaxy? What is out there in our cosmic neighborhood? Let me take you on a tour. Our closest neighbor is Andromeda, a massive spiral galaxy, a lot like the Milky Way. This image, to most of us, is what a galaxy looks like. A swirly disk glows bright with the combined light of 10 billion stars, each like our sun. But not all galaxies look like this. The tiny thing in the white box is also a galaxy because its stars are bound by gravity and travel together through space. This is a dwarf galaxy with a thousand times fewer stars than Andromeda. Dwarf galaxies are our smallest neighbors, but they're not all. In 2015, my group discovered an even stranger type of galaxies, which we call ultra-diffuse galaxies, or UDGs. I study UDGs because they're mysteriously puffy UDGs have as many stars as the small dwarf galaxy in the white box, but they're as big as Andromeda. That makes them extremely faint, and conventional telescopes have a hard time seeing them. That's why my group built the Dragonfly Telescope in New Mexico. Like the eyes of a dragonfly, our telescope has multiple lenses that minimize noise and artifacts allowing UDGs to stand out in dragonfly data as big, diffuse blobs, shown on the far right. Once we identify UDGs with dragonfly, we can request the Hubble Space Telescope to take a high-resolution picture. That's how I made this image on the bottom left, the clearest picture of a UDG to date. What I want to do in my PhD is to find nearby UDGs and understand how they formed. We have already found UDGs that defy the traditional picture of galaxy formation, but we haven't found enough of them to say whether UDGs share this in common. With a bigger sample, 
we will get a more complete picture of how UDGs form. From dragonfly data, I expect to find dozens of UDGs around us that have never been seen before. That's a major update to our map of the nearby universe. So next time you look up at the night sky, say hi to our newly found ultra-diffuse galaxy neighbors. Our next speaker is Thomas Monroe, a fourth year student in classics. Thomas's three minute thesis title is Contextualizing Classical Reception in Postwar Britain. Everywhere we look around us, we see the marks of the Greeks and Romans. In art and architecture, law and literature, people continue to build, write, and even legislate with one eye on these long gone societies. And when someone does this, when someone goes back to the past for a model or a reference point, they're engaging in a tradition that stretches back to the Renaissance. Yet it's only been in the last 30 years that classicists have tried to scrutinize the precise dynamics of this cultural phenomenon. And when they do, they can sometimes overgeneralize the effect that the past has had on the present throughout history. What I do differently is put historical context first when analyzing the influence of the Greeks and Romans. Now, to fully contextualize their impact will be the work of hundreds of lifetimes, so I limit myself to analyzing their presence in the literature of my native UK in the last 75 years. Within these bounds, I've identified five key factors that influence what we classicists call the reception of the ancient world. The first is educational change. The status of classical studies has declined, and with it, the impact of a formalized classical education writers once received has been diminished. The second is the anxiety of annihilation that began during the Cold War and continues today with the threat of climate change. Writers constantly ask, what good are ancient myths and stories to us today? The third is the decline of the British Empire. The Victorians loved to compare Britain to Athens and Rome, mighty imperial powers of the past. I track changing conceptions in classicizing literature as these comparisons cease to have any weight. My fourth and fifth chapters look at Britain's involvement in conflicts overseas and changing social policy at home, respectively. I'm interested in how these change the analogies writers find in classicizing literature for their own experience. And I'm not just interested in what myths get used, but how they're used and how audiences react. So a kind of example is on the left of my slide. The Iraq War, image one, prompted the playwright Martin Crimp to adapt a play about the death of Heracles, image two, a potent yet ambiguous symbol of violence and heroism. By bringing it into our own times and setting it on a modern military airbase, image three, audiences and critics, image four, quickly understood that it was a critique of ongoing Western interventionism. All the factors I discuss influence and intersect with one another. I pry them apart because I try to delineate the exact effects of each. In more precisely understanding the effect that modern history has had on our conceptions of the distant past, we're one step closer to understanding our ongoing fascination with the Greeks and Romans today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Satesha Paratkar, a fifth year student in pathology. Satesha's three minute thesis title is Investigating the Role of PARG in Cancer Drug Resistance. The biggest hurdle in cancer treatment today is when the drug stops working. A drug that was once working to kill the cancer suddenly stops working and the cancer becomes drug resistant. This can happen in 90% of patients for certain drugs. My research focuses on discovering how cancers develop resistance so that we can prevent it from happening and make sure the cancer stays drug sensitive. I first began by comparing data between a drug sensitive and a drug resistant cancer to see if I could find any differences. Interestingly, there was one thing that really set the two apart, and that was this protein called PARG, or PARG for short. Proteins are workhorses of the cell, each doing their own thing to keep the cell going. PARG stands for poly ADP ribose glycohydrolase, and it is an enzyme that helps chop things up in the cell. My findings showed that when cancers have PARG, they are drug sensitive, meaning that the drug is able to kill the cancer cells. When cancers lose PARG, however, the drug stops working and the cancer keeps growing. With PARG, I now had a big clue, but an important question still remained. 
what is the connection between the drug and this protein, PARG? To answer this question, I used a super high resolution microscope to look at what happens in cells that don't have PARG, and I actually stumbled on a new function for the protein. Cells carry a large number of proteins, each doing their own thing in different parts of the cell. What PARG does is it keeps these proteins separate from each other. When cells lose PARG, however, it causes a number of proteins to come together to form an aggregate. Suppose I show you small pieces of different colors of Play-Doh, I then mix them all together to form a big ball, it's likely the color brown now, and I tell you to separate out the individual colors. It's impossible, right? That's what a protein aggregate is. It becomes impossible to locate the individual proteins anymore. Now, what does this have to do with the drug? Well, most cancer drugs work by binding to a very specific protein in the cell known as its drug target. In my experiments, I saw that the drug target was actually stuck in an aggregate, in that big brown blob of Play-Doh, making it impossible for the drug to find its target. And if the drug can't find its target, it won't be able to kill the cancer, leading to drug resistance. Through my research, I have discovered how cancers become drug resistant. Future research can now focus on how to stop cancers from losing PARG. The goal of a cancer drug is to not stop working until every last cancer cell is destroyed. And with my research, we are one critical step closer to achieving that goal. Thank you. Up next, we have Anna Lin, a fourth year student in biomedical engineering. Anna's three minute thesis title is How Can We Cure Diseases Before Birth? The question that's inspired my thesis research is simple How can we cure disease before birth? Every four and a half minutes, a baby is born in the US with a serious birth defect or disease. These conditions are so serious because even before birth, they've begun causing abnormal development in the fetal body. Recent advances in prenatal diagnostics mean that we have an earlier window of opportunity in which to begin treatment, and this exciting field is called fetal therapy. Currently, fetal therapy is focused either on surgical procedures, which come with their own set of risks, or medicines administered to the mother, which may come with side effects to her and be less effective in the fetus. So ideally, we would be able to treat these fetal diseases safely and directly. That's where my research in nanoparticle drug delivery comes in. Think about the extended release medicines you may have gotten at your pharmacy. Nanoparticles are small capsules similar to that, but at the nanoscale, so we're talking even smaller than a cell. The cool thing about nanoparticles is that by changing the materials I use to make them, I can control important factors like how the cargo is delivered and which cells in the body are targeted. I like to think of myself as the designer of a custom FedEx delivery system. So you give me a package and a destination, and it's my job to get it there. Maybe my first thought is to deliver your package via bicycle. This would work, but it might be slow, and the package strapped to the bike wouldn't be protected so it might get damaged along the way. This is what it's like to deliver traditional medicine. Instead, I could think of using a delivery vehicle, like a car or a truck, that would be better at protecting and delivering your package. Each vehicle comes with its own advantages and disadvantages, such as how much it can carry, how fast it can go, and what routes are available to it. This is what it's like to deliver a drug using a nanoparticle. In my lab, our job is to consider all of these options and then design the best type of nanoparticle for a specific application. For my thesis, I'm working to leverage the power of nanoparticles to enhance fetal therapy. I work with nanoparticles made of a material called PLGA. PLGA is known to be very good at delivering lots of medicines for lots of diseases, and it can be even further enhanced by the addition of small molecules called PEG to the surface. The addition of PEG gives the nanoparticles properties that can help them avoid potential roadblocks in the body. After I make these nanoparticles, I deliver them to fetal mice by delivering into the amniotic fluid. I've found that by increasing the amount of PEG on the surface, the nanoparticles show better stability in amniotic fluid, can be detected in fetal organs for a longer amount of time, and have targeted delivery to the fetal lungs. The coolest thing about this project is that these nanoparticles have the potential to encapsulate lots of cargo and be applied to lots of different diseases. So in continuing to optimize this system, we're taking groundbreaking steps forward and one day being able to cure disease before birth. Thank you.
Our next presenter is Neem Wen, a fifth year student in economics. Neem's three minute thesis title is Moving Up or Moving Out? Welfare Impacts of Spatial Policies in Vietnam. Imagine that you have a garden. You can see that while some plants flourished, others struggled to grow. What are you going to do about these struggling plants? Are you going to uproot them, move them to better soil? Or are you going to bring nutrients and resources to their locations and hope that they will thrive? This dilemma translated a problem that policies makers usually face, whether to move people out of impoverished areas or to bring firms and jobs opportunities to their locations. As an economist, I'm interested in the net gains of these policies, and Vietnam provides the unique context that have never been explored before. In the 2000s, the government passed two policies, one of which is the household migration incentive for people to move from rural to urban areas. At the same time, the government passed a tax break for firms to move from urban to rural areas. In my thesis, I aim to quantify the net gains of these policies on households and firms. Quantifying the net gains is challenging because the net gains contains two components, one of which is very difficult to measure. The relatively easy one is monetary, such as income and profits that I gather from many Vietnamese data sources, including national surveys of more than 90 million people and surveys that follow more than 3 million firms over the past two decades. However, net gains also contain another component, which I call references for people or intangible for firms. For example, many firms such as the tech firms in Silicon Valley refer being closer to one another because they value face-to-face -face interactions so that, it, so that they can share knowledge and ideas and thus unlikely to move out of urban areas. Unfortunately, we do not have good data to measure these intangibles. To tackle the challenge, I built a new method to estimate references and intangibles based on how strongly people and firms respond to policy changes. My estimate revealed that firms prioritize profits while people seem to prioritize references. Therefore, firms are more likely to move than people. This finding suggests that tax breaks, if designed carefully, can be effective at reducing inequality. It is challenging for each of us to deal with our struggling plants in our gardens. But with the right information and tools, we can, we can overcome these challenges. My research provides essential tools for policymakers to confront policy tensions and to make informed choices that could create a more thriving global society. Our final presenter is Kaustav Mitra a fifth-year student in the astronomy department. Kostov's three-minute thesis title is Weighing Galaxies to Quantify Some Fundamental Properties of the Universe. I was riding a carousel and the wooden horse that I was sitting on, it was going around at the speed of a bullet. If I told you this, what would you say? Something like, Speed of a bullet, that's impossible. You wouldn't be able to hold on. You will lose your grip and fly outward. If you say that, you would be right. We have a very good intuition about the link between the speed of an orbiting object and the force required to hold on to it, to make it go around. Now we can quantify this intuition, but basically, if the speed is higher, a much stronger force is required. The same principle applies to satellite galaxies. So when we look through the telescope, we see many small galaxies moving around larger ones. But they're moving way too fast. It can't be the gravity of the central larger galaxy is just not strong enough to hold everything together. But wait, how do we measure speeds of galaxies? We do that by something called the Doppler effect. So when an ambulance is coming towards us versus when it's going away from us, the pitch of the sound is different. The pitch is higher when it's coming towards us. 
Now, the same thing happens in light waves just as it does in sound waves. So we can measure the Doppler effect of the light coming from these many small galaxies, and we get to measure their speed. And it's a million miles per hour. Wait, a million miles per hour? That's impossible. Metaphorically, they should lose their grip and fly outward. But these galaxies are not flying away, which means there is some mysterious force. There is some invisible form of matter, a lot of it, producing this immensely strong gravity to hold everything together. Now, this was one of the earliest and is one of the finest evidence supporting the existence of dark matter. I use a sophisticated version of the same technique, but on tens of thousands of such groups of galaxies, and I measured the amount of dark matter in each of them. So basically, I weigh galaxies based on their motion, and by doing a full survey of it, I try to answer questions like, what is the amount of dark matter in the universe? What are the different ingredients of the universe and in exactly what proportion? And from all of these, what can we say about the large-scale structure of our cosmos and how galaxies form, grow, and evolve? Thank you. That concludes our presentations. Please join me in another round of applause for our impressive presenters. I now invite our judges and Dean Cooley to join me on stage. We'll have the chance to learn more about their careers and how communication skills have been pivotal for their success. I will now hand the floor back to Dean Cooley. All right, well, thank you for joining me up on the stage, everyone. Wasn't that a remarkable set of, of uh, talks we just heard? Yeah. So I've uh, introduced you to the audience, so I thought we might just get some conversation going for a few minutes, and maybe um, you could remind me how long we have here? Oh, great, okay. Um, so I have a couple of questions. I could try to get the conversation started. And I guess um, you all are doing such different things in your lives after Yale. Maybe you could comment on um, how you've developed your communication skill and how that has been important in your career. So, I don't know, Kat, you're farthest away from me. Maybe I'll start with you. Hi. <laughs> Is this on? Good. Um, so, uh, as we talked about earlier, I have an educational consulting company, and I, in the very beginning of my career, had to work on my communication skills because I give presentations to students, parents, and uh, K-12 schools all over the globe. Um, so I had to understand um, who, always who my audience was, very important, and then how to communicate um, most clearly, effectively, and in a fun way, because I believe that you have to show your personality when you're talking. And, um, and engage your audience. And at the end of all of the presentations I give, I always um, leave room for audience participation, q and I think um, addressing people individually when I can is always really helpful, answering people's questions, um, and really listening to the people in the audience. Um, so anyway, yes, I've had to work on my communication skills. And in the very beginning of my career, um, I actually did some media training because I was doing a lot of TV. So I had to learn how to speak in sound bites and go, you know, if I was on CNN and get my point across in just a blip, you know, as a, a sound bite. I didn't know how to do that originally, but I got some great media training. I did a couple of sessions and then I was off to the races and have done all sorts of on TV interviews, which has been a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. It's a special skill getting a sound bite out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, David? Well, my uh, career can basically be divided into two. One was the corporate world where I was the head of the M&A department for Latin America and Asia at JP Morgan Bankers Trust. I actually created the departments back in the 80s. 
And that was basically getting to work with teams, being able to lead them, to advise them, to develop and support your team, and also work with your superiors in terms of making sure that the goals are clear and that you're reporting appropriately and, and successfully. So that's one thing that I think is very important is the ability to learn how you can interact with others and uh, both be a leader and a, and a listener, which is very important, and getting feedback from those people that you trust constantly uh, so that you can develop those skills and correct and, and enhance your abilities. On the latter side, which is since 1989, I've been a hedge fund investor. So I started with George Soros and Julian Robertson early on when they still weren't famous. And my job is to basically be a talent scout. So I have to interview hedge fund managers or alternative fund managers and their teams and determine if they have integrity, if they have a clear methodology that's exceptional, if their team is cohesive, if they manage the, the, they're, they're enthusiastic and productive, and, uh, and then the market judges the rest of the things. So that's very important. Feedback is a really key thing. I think with the innovations that we have now with the internet and taping and everything else, those, those, those are tools you really should use, both uh, feedback from your friends personally, practice constantly to refine, and then videotape yourself under certain different circumstances, and you'll see things that the eye doesn't see easily, but can be refined and, and enhanced. I did that once. It was the scariest thing ever, <laughs> watching it yourself. It is embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kim, how about you? Well, I have to begin with the story of having been a graduate student at Yale in, in the humanities and being a TA, and I would walk into the, into the lecture halls like this. I remember Ed Morgan over in the Yale Law School, and he literally read from his book. So we didn't learn how to communicate. Um, and when I started, I know, seriously, they read from their book, and they read, they would walk, you know, David Montgomery, Nancy Cott, phenomenal scholars. They would walk in with 12 page, 15 pages of lecture and read it. Um, and as a TA, I had the privilege of translating that. Um, and so I think, you know, I learned very clearly very, from the beginning that good communication means translating to your audiences. Um, I think I started doing that intuitively and intentionally because when I walked into the classroom, the demands of students dramatically changed. And I think I was a, one of a generation of scholars that had to learn actually how to teach and not have the luxury of 90 minutes to read a 15-page paper. I instead had to work in 10 or 15-minute sound bites that began to increasingly include Q&A because we were working with a generation of students who believed that every idea they had was magic. <laughs> and, and, and I think that that also taught me very clearly how to listen to people's ideas because they were smart. My students were smart. Let me, let me tell you that. Um, and so, you know, not, I, you know, I had to like tear down the wall, engage in all of those things. Um, and I think my, you know, like David, my career dramatically shifted when I went into administration. And the role of the dean is to listen to 400 faculty who clearly have strong ideas. You can speak to, to Dean Cooley, who have a broad array of talent and um, experience and the like. Um, and, and, you do a lot of listening, not only to faculty, but to students, to parents, and to lawyers. I spent a lot of time with lawyers. That's a whole other story. Um, when I left the academy, I you know, retired. I had two strokes, and that taught me how to listen in a really dramatically different way. And I entered into a new phase where I began as a volunteer in nonprofits, helping to raise money, um, to work with students who had no idea why or how they could go to college. So just learning the different audiences um, as well. Lately, I've been listening to my husband. I don't think, is Marcus here? He's probably stepped up to take a phone call. I'm married to a, bio, I'm married to a biotech um, entrepreneur who does drug discovery, as we've heard from several of you. And, you know, he's a chemist. 
He has a PhD in chemistry, but he's had to learn the business side to raise millions of dollars for the companies that he started, most late, lately Essient um, Pharm Pharmaceuticals that's raised over $170 million. And I think he and I come from very different fields, but we do the same thing. And that is to tell a really good story. You have to tell a good story. And finally, writing a novel like you, next week, I'm going to pitch to agents. And that's a whole other story and skill set. So thank you. Do you get more than three minutes to do no, it? No, I actually get three minutes. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. It's, 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 it's speed dating, you know? <laughs> Bert, how about you? Thank you. So I heard, uh, I learned uh, 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 speaking really in graduate school. Uh, my advisor, my thesis advisor, had a very rigorous weekly meeting. There was uh, rotation, weekly rotations. And in those group meetings, we, we learned and he encouraged people had to ask all kinds of questions and you better be ready to answer them, all of them. So. You prepared yourself really well before you went in there. And so that's really the biggest thing that I learned in graduate school, I feel. And as I started my own business, I used that same philosophy with our employees and about communication and making each of them be expressive of their ideas, but be ready and equipped enough to answer questions to all their colleagues. So in open field, just like that. I use that as a model, really and it's worked for me. Wonderful. Thank I, you. I love that you brought up tell a story, because in my field, when we publish papers, we say, ah, oh, that's a nice story. You know, because you, you, you might not even report what you did in chronological order. You might make it be a better story, right? Um, so uh, I just thought I would make a confession along this line, which is the first time I gave a talk as a young uh, college student. Yeah, I was a college student. I fainted. Oh my God, it was so embarrassing. I was so nervous and scared, I actually passed out. Um, the second time I gave a talk, I actually uh, got up the courage to do it again in graduate school, and my hands were shaking so hard I had to keep them in my pockets so no one would see, but I got through it without fainting. So I guess my, my message there is don't give up. Nobody, I, I haven't really ever met anybody who is just a natural, great communicator. You really do have to work at it and listen to feedback. So yeah, I think those were really great points. So I guess another thing um, you might be able to help share with our students is any advice you have on how they could best use their time in graduate school to prepare for the world outside of Yale, maybe around communication or any other kind of thing that you have found to be valuable in your life that you can trace back to your time at Yale. I think networking is very important. As a graduate student, you have a tendency to stay in your own little silo. So now with the Zoom and all these uh, distance uh, communication, as well as here at Yale, we have dozens of people coming here all the time. They're very prestigious, very, very important to the world. Make an effort to go out and go to the meetings, go to these sessions, and meet people. Uh, the YAA, the Yale Alumni Association, has a lot of programs. Uh, that, of, that, of that nature. So that's the main thing is go out and network, expose yourself to new environments because the most important thing in your lives will be passion. Obviously, we have some passion here, right? And that's what you want. Otherwise, you're just simply, you know, getting a salary or, or doing something that's, that's not all that engaging. I, I agree. I was going to say the same thing is your network is your safety net ultimately later in life. So work it right now. I mean, you should be doing your research, um, figuring out the alums that you want to connect with. Um, so, you know, start with Yale, right? You can start with uh, the alumni network. You can, you know, just start looking at what you want to do in life. You know, go on LinkedIn and, like, reverse engineer where they, <laughs> where they are, where they started, and, um, and reach out to people. It's so easy today to create your network, and you're in a very privileged place to do it. Um, and so the more connections you make, the more relationships you make now, uh, those are people that could potentially 
help you in your future. They're people that you would potentially work with in the future. Um, so getting your three minute pitch is important because you might have to put that into an email as a cold introduction. Um, and then you might get a, I don't know, a 15 minute Zoom with someone. I would say take those opportunities now. Um, I think the relationships you cultivate are, is the most important thing in life. If I could pass this on to you, but the, I, I don't know if you know the, uh, if you've heard about the longest longitudinal study, it comes out of Harvard. Um, it's a, a more than 75 year study on what makes a good life, what makes a happy life, and it is the quality of your relationships. So I think the biggest thing, at least it, when I think back on my being here at Yale, um, a lot of my time was alone in, you know, I was in the library, I was researching, I was at my computer, I was um, reading, um, and, and again, it was a different time. It was, you know, pre-social media, so it was a long time ago. But um, I think today I would have approached that time differently and made far more connections. Um, with the, you know, in this greater community. Um, and I think that will enhance your lives no matter what you end up doing. Which in a way is a, a big form of communication, right? Re What's that? It's a, a type of communication, reaching out to people where yes. you might feel a little shy, but if you do it, it makes a big difference. I would tell you that the best thing I ever did was say yes to being the Bruton High School marching band treasurer. Where I, which I was for seven years with two kids who were brilliant musicians, which meant that I was working with parents, some of whom had never gotten out of high school. They, they, maybe they had a GED, two others who were like myself, but squarely in the middle, I think there were a cadre of parents who went off to the Iraq war. And why I'm, why I'm telling you this is the vast array of people's experiences. Um, and so I would say, you know, work beyond the people that you know. I, I second what's been said already, but learn to communicate with people who do not walk in your sphere. Do it with kindness and do it with intention. And volunteering, I think, is the most critical way you can do that. Um, and I also think read. Read outside of your discipline. I think the thing that makes my heart break is when I hear people say, I don't read novels or short stories or poetry anymore. Oh, I never read anything about science or climate. There is so much information out there, you can link it in to your iPhone and you can get, you can get a poem a day from the Poetry Foundation. Here, I think we learn that reading builds empathy. It's not just knowledge, but it's deep empathy. And I think finding the language to speak to others, but also hear from others, is one of the most critical things, the most unique things we do as humans. And I think developing that will go a long way, not only to your career and your life work, but to you as a human being. Fabulous, thank you. So Bert, you get the last word here. Okay, uh, I, I wanna say that maybe the uh, uh, most important thing and I draw from my own experience, not everybody knows what they want to do in life. And this is, a, being in graduate school for me was a maturing time. And uh, so when you start your graduate school career, you're lucky enough to be in such an unbelievable platform here. Having this university as your platform is unbelievable everywhere around the world. So it doesn't necessarily mean what you started with, and at the end of your, whatever number of years you spend here, what you started, you will want to end the same. Don't feel obligated because you have been here. Because this platform will help you achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. And at the time that I was in graduate school it was a different era. There was a real pressure. There was a stigma about wanting to go outside of what you were trained for. I think the environment from what I understand is better today. So, but don't be afraid, because you have the rest of your life. So, good luck. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much for all those I was comments. Make a plug. I was going to make a plug for Cross Campus, if you haven't used it yeah. or gotten on it to it. We have 180,000, I believe, living alumni. They're all there. You could reach out to them. You're two or three degrees of separation from 180,000 alumni, most of whom will react if you're sincere, authentic, and prepared. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you for that plug. That's a good one. Okay, so I think we're out of time, and we'll turn it back over to Sari. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to our judges. The judges will now leave the room to deliberate for 20 minutes, while you, the audience, gets to vote for your favorite presentations. As I mentioned earlier, we will be giving two People's Choice Awards of $300 each to the best presentations in two different categories. The first is the humanities and social sciences, and the other is STEM, which encompasses biological, physical, and engineering and applied sciences. For those of you attending in person, please scan the QR code on the screen or in your brochure on the second inside page. For those of you on Zoom, you can scan the QR code or click the link just sent in the chat by Jacob Gonzalez. We will leave the poll open for 15 minutes, so please vote promptly. You all did such a wonderful job, and I just want to say another round of applause. Okay, so I'm going to start with the People's Choice Awards that you all voted for while we were disappeared. Um, and I'm going to start with the Humanities Social Sciences uh, People's Choice Award, and that goes to Catherine Graves. Yep. Okay. So, there you go. Thank you. Oh. So, we have a little picture here. Oh. <laughs> Why don't you just Thank like you. stand? Sure. Okay. Okay, good. All right. And next is the STEM People's Choice Award. You ready? I have to stand in the box. Um, the, this goes to Sateja Paradkar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's, here's where it got really hard. Um, but I'm gonna start with our third choice winner, and that is Zili Chen. Great. Okay, I, wait, I have to turn a page to get, sorry, okay. And in second place, Elizabeth Wu. So we're moving up the money here. We're up to $500. <laughs> OK. Um, Finally, finally, our first place winner this year, uh, and who, and actually any one of, of you finalist contestants may be called upon to, for repeat performances on other venues. This has been known to happen in past years. Okay, our first place winner is Sateja Paradkar. <laughs> Awesome job, every single one. So thank you very, very much for putting in the hard work and doing and making these beautiful presentations. Also, thank you very much to the judges to coming from near and far to help with this extremely difficult judging, judging um, challenge. So I thought just to, to um, uh, I, I would invite um, Sateja just maybe to just make a one, one or two minutes of comments about what this, how this process has been and what it's meant for you. So you have to stand in the box, okay. though. <laughs> uh, all right, well, thank you, oh, first of all. Sorry, sorry. 
Um, thank you to the judges, thank you to Dean Cooley, thank you to the organizers, um, thanks to my fellow contestants, and thanks to everybody in the audience. I see you, I see you staying till 7 p.m. Um, this process was incredibly challenging, but incredibly rewarding. Um, I want to thank Julia, who's in the audience, Hyunja, and Jacob for all their very helpful feedback throughout the, throughout the process. Um, it's, I have a funny moment that Julia taught us about that every time we come up on stage, we had to stand in our power pose, which is like shoulders back, feet apart, and just basically projecting confidence. And a bunch of people in my lab actually walked by when I was doing that power pose in lab. So everybody could see I took this very seriously and was trying to do everything that the, the three minute certificate program um, asked to do. Um, I think it is very, very difficult to condense your thesis research down to three minutes, particularly because I don't think I fully understood my research until I did this three-minute thesis. Um, and I really, really want to thank uh, everybody who gave me any feedback along the way. I really appreciate the feedback, and I really feel like um, I've learned how to take constructive feedback and sort of ignore the feedback that maybe doesn't serve, serve me for that, uh, for that time. And so it's been really rewarding to do this. Um, I want to congratulate all the other contestants as well. I thought um, these presentations were absolutely incredible. And I can't wait to see um, where we present our research next. So thank you so much. You. OK. That that concludes this year's three-minute thesis. Thank you so much for coming, people on Zoom, people in the room.